Well, it's nice to visit Louisiana, Brother Danny, but there's no place like Texas. Amen. Will you take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 5? I love coming to Milldale, and it humbles me any time I have the opportunity to preach. I feel so inadequate to be amongst such spiritual giants that God has used to stand at this platform where so many great men of God, or I should probably more properly say so many men that have been so greatly used of God have preached, uh, and it's just an honor and a privilege to be here. Would you join me in standing out of honor and reverence of the preaching of the Lord's Word? And I'm going to preach today on this subject, the peril of modern Christianity, from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 5. Uh, Let's begin together in verse number 30, where the Bible says, An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? Our Father and our God, we come to you, Lord, in the only name that matters. The name of the Lord Jesus. And Father, I just confess today that I'm nothing. And Lord, if if all these people here is my sermon, Lord, then it will profit nothing. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll make our hearts bare and open, pliable, tilled up, ready for the seed of the Word of God. Help us to hear more than the voice of a man. Help us today to hear your voice. And as our brothers already preach, break our hearts. Help us to be broken over sin. In Jesus I pray. And all who agree say amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, the prophet Jeremiah was called to a, an extremely difficult ministry of preaching the truth of God's holy word to a people who wouldn't listen to him. The nation of Israel, and really more locally Judah, had become so corrupt, so full of sin and pride, and so consumed by a rebellious nature that not only would they not listen to the prophet of God, but they violently rejected Jeremiah and the message that he preached. His life was threatened. On many occasions, he was imprisoned. God had raised this man up and put his divine words into his mouth. It was the plea from the God of Israel to have the people turn from their sin and their wickedness, lest the judgment of God fall down on them. And in spite of God's many pleas to his people, in spite of his constant calling out to them to repent and to turn to him, the people of God continued to reject the Lord. They reject His holiness. They rejected His word. They rejected His call for repentance. And because the people refused to hear the word of the Lord, the Bible says that God sent judgment on them. You know God still judges. And He raised up the nation of Babylon and they came in and they conquered Jerusalem when many of them thought it would be impossible for the people of God to fall. And they carried away all of the articles of the temple and they carried away many people to be captives in Babylon, and they slaughtered and murdered many many of the others. Can I just stop here and tell you this morning, it's a dangerous thing to reject God's call to repentance. We ought not to mess with God. Israel had become a stubborn and a stiff-necked people. My brothers and sisters in the Lord, I stand here today not as a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet. I'm just a man. Just a preacher, and I have a Bible on this pulpit to preach the Word of God. But I do stand here today as God's messenger, one who's been called of the Lord. And I want to tell you in the name of Jesus that this land, this nation, and the so-called church in America is in grave danger of facing the thrice holy God in judgment. We're in grave danger. We are at this very hour making the very same mistakes that the nation of Judah made. We're making the same mistakes of the past. 
We respond to the truth of God's Word much like the people to whom Jeremiah preached. We close our ears to it. We respond with anger and with bitterness and with resentment. And we stubbornly refuse to heed call after call after call to repent of our sin and to embrace the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The application of this text could not be made more clear. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The word astonishing is a word that refers to the spectacle of desolation and the reaction that it causes. It's to look upon something that is is so disturbing, it's it's so mind-boggling that the shock of it can produce both an emotional and a physical, uh, physical reaction. To be astonished as this term is used in the Bible is to be so disturbed by what you see that you're not only heartbroken over it, but it nauseates you. It makes you sick to your stomach. God says here, an astonishing and a horrible thing has been committed in the land. There is something here that is so terrible, so horrible, so devastating, so unspeakable, so terrible that this act produces an astonishing reaction to the degree of crushing one's emotions and furthermore causing one to become sick over the horror and the terror of this terrible deed. So the question becomes then, what could be so terrible? What could possibly be so horrible that it would provoke such a reaction? Well, it's right there in the Bible. Look in verse 31. And notice that it's it's the people of God that is called out. It's not when the pagans or the idolaters, it's not the liberals, it's not the environmentalist wackos, it's not those who are participants in false religions and false cults. No, the horrible deed that is spoken of in the Bible is when the people of God willingly forsake the Lord. And I don't know about anybody else here today, but my fear is, and I realize I'm a, I, I'm a newcomer, I'm a Johnny come lately on the, on the scene, but I fear that this is indeed the current spiritual condition of modern Christianity in our land. An astonishing and horrible act has been committed. A terrible act has been committed. And I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus, we must repent. The church of the living God must repent or we will face the judgment of God. I think that the case is we've waited far too long for the lost to get right. We've waited far too long for the liberals to get right. And we've been pointing our fingers at the outside world for far too long. And we need to realize that we've got three of our own pointing right back at us. The problem's not out there. The problem is right here. It's with us. And so there are just two things I want to share with you that I see from Jeremiah chapter 5 that I believe are applicable to us today. The peril of modern Christianity. The first thing I want you to see is the sin in the pulpit. In verse 31, the Bible says, The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. The sin in the pulpit begins with a false message. The prophets prophesy falsely. That word prophesy is a very interesting word. It means to bubble up or to pour forth. It's the idea of a senseless babbling. The word that is used here in this text is often used in the Old Testament with with reference to false prophets and literally it refers to acting insane, playing the madman through agitated and sporadic movements. It reflects instability, craziness, insanity. It's senseless, useless, worthless babbling. To prophesy or to preach in this manner is to bubble up or or to pour forth a senseless, meaningless babbling as though you're a crazy man preaching some sort of crazy message. And such is the condition of modern Christianity. Would you agree with me when I say that we live in a time when the prophets are prophesying falsely? False messages all across our land. The gospel message of Jesus Christ has been shunned in the church for the insane babblings of man-made, man-centered theology running rampant in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And if the truth be told today, the church in America has become very much like the church at Sardis, who the Lord Jesus wrote to in the book of Revelation, chapter 3 and verse 1, and He identified their spiritual conditions, where the Bible said, these things, says the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, but you are dead. There's the church at Sardis, the church that had a lot going on, the church that had works, the church that had a name. It was popular. It was the place to be. It was exciting. It's had the famous preacher. It's where everybody wanted to go. And it believed that of itself, it was on fire for God. But when the Lord peeled back the layers and Jesus began to describe this body of Christ, He looked at them and He said, You're not alive, you're dead. Dead, lifeless, useless to the kingdom of God. And I don't know about you, but I believe that this accurately describes the spiritual condition of modern Christianity in the United States of America. Because the prophets are prophesying falsely. We're preaching false messages. Men are standing in pulpits and they're leading churches astray by declaring lies from the pulpit. You say, well, preacher, what are some of these false messages? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to answer them. There are a lot of false messages, but I want to highlight some. Four in particular that I believe are the most prominent in our land. And in my opinion, they're destroying the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first message is the prosperity gospel message. One that stems largely from the charismatic movement. But I tell you, you're a fool if you don't think that the Baptists that sit on your pew don't turn on the hell of vision and listen to every John, Johnny come lately that tells them to send in their thousand dollar seed and God will give them the hundredfold return. They're sitting in your churches and they're watching them and they're listening to them and they're letting these lies penetrate their hearts and they're believing the lies of the enemy. Can I just tell you, can I just be bold this morning? Would that be all right? Are y'all still with me today? I'm telling you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a blatant lie from the pit of a devil's hell when a man mounts the pulpit and says that if your faith is in the right spot and you've been exercising it just properly, then you're going to have all the money you want in your bank account and you're never going to have any problems and you're never going to have any health issues. I want you to know that's a lie. If you believe that garbage, then get on a plane and go with me and we'll go over to India and I'll show you some pastors with bruises on their faces, scars on their body where they've been beaten within an inch of of their lives just so that they can get to a place to hear the Word of God preached. If you believe that, then get on a plane and go over to China where there are brothers and sisters in Christ who have to sneak around in the darkness of night so they can go and meet with a man who will open up the book and preach the Word of God because it's a crime to be a Bible-believing Christian in China. The fact of the matter is there's men and women all over this land who suffer, I mean who suffer, whose bodies are falling apart, who suffer persecution, and they've got more faith in their little pinky nail than every charlatan wearing a thousand dollar Armani suit who mounts the television. Can I get a witness in the house? If you can't preach your message worldwide, then you might as well sit up and shut up, shut, shut up and don't preach the Word of God again. Try reading your Bible sometime and you'll find a man named Job who was one of the most faithful men. In fact, it was God who said to the devil, that man is a righteous man. And can I tell you that when God says you're righteous, honey, you're righteous. Huh? God said he was faithful and yet he suffered. Paul was a faithful man of God, and yet he suffered. In fact, he described his own Christian walk in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where he said, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often, from the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in perils of city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils of the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. We're patting people on the head. We're telling them they can have their best life now. We can tell them that they have all the money in the bank and no health problems. And Paul says, this was my life since I came to know Jesus. I've suffered. 
And it was God who said and testified of Paul, I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. I submit to you that the prosperity gospel message is a lie developed by sinful men so that they can make a profit off of spiritually immature and spiritually hurting people. And it's in our churches. And then there's the seeker-sensitive message. And this movement begins with a false premise. It attempts supposedly to reach an individual that doesn't even exist. Those in the seeker movement say that they want to be culturally relevant. They want to be sensitive to those who are honestly seeking a relationship with God. Now the problem with that, you certainly you can see it, can't you? The problem with that is there's no such thing as a lost man who seeks after God. Unless, of course, God sought him first. That's why the Bible said in Romans 3.11 that there's none who seeks after God. In other words, a man in his lost sinful condition doesn't have uh, the, the heart nor the capacity to seek after the Lord. That's why the Bible said or the Lord Jesus said that no one can come to me unless the Father which sent me draw him. The only seeker is the Lord God of heaven. Is there an amen in the house? And sadly today, in the name of being seeker sensitive, under the guise of being relevant with the idea that the church is supposedly trying to reach the next generation, in reality what has happened is the church has watered down the gospel of Christ, she's compromised her convictions, and in reality she sold out the Lord Jesus Christ who bought her with his own shed blood. Now don't misunderstand me. I believe when the gospel is preached, a man ought to respond. You've got to get saved. God's got to draw you. You've got to respond to the drawing power of God. And I desire for men to be saved. I pastor in Sulphur Springs. I want to reach that whole city, that whole county. I want to reach all of Texas. I want to reach the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. My heart is to see lost sinners saved. But can I tell you that as much as we want to reach people with the gospel for our Lord and for our Savior, we cannot and we must not do it at the expense of compromising the truth of the Word of God. As the church of Christ, we don't have any business going out in our communities and surveying to find out what lost people want in the church, what kind of movie clips they want to watch, what kind of music that they want to watch. And preacher, can I tell you, you don't need to go ask a lost man how you need to minister to a lost man. All you need to do is open up your Bible. The Bible is just as relevant today as the day when God inspired the men moved by the Holy Ghost to put the ink on the parchment. Just stand up, preach hell hot, sin black, judgment sure, heaven sweet, and Jesus safe. Let the Holy Ghost of God move in the hearts of His people when the Word of God is preached. We need to just leave the results up to the Lord. Amen? And then there's the emergent church message. I believe it's one of the most dangerous going on today. The idea behind the emergent church movement is that conventional church has failed. And what we need to do is completely revolutionize how we do church in order to be effective in this world. Now, I'm not against change. I'm not against uh, new methods. But I'm just going to tell you, you've got to learn to read between the lines when you hear certain things. And more often than not, what that means is that in order to be relevant to the world, then what we really need to do is compromise on doctrine. Compromise things like righteousness and holiness and and moral purity. We need to compromise theology for the sake of relationships. And it gets even worse than that because some of the main leaders of the emergent church question essential core Christian doctrine that defines what biblical Christianity is all about. Rob Bell just wrote a new book, Heaven, Hell, and, well, I forget the rest of it. He's one of the main emergent church leaders. He questions the virgin birth of Christ, questions the exclusivity of Christ. Brian McLaren, his partner in this demonic religion, perhaps the most known leader, questions the exclusivity of Christ. Both of them endorse the Jesus Seminar Group, which is a group that that blatantly denies the deity of Jesus Christ. I want you to know something, if Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, then he was born a sinner. And if he was born a sinner, this Bible is a lie. Let's pack up and go to the house. Let's eat, drink, and be merry because none of it's true. And if there's another way other than Jesus, then the Bible's a lie. Let's go eat, drink, and be merry because it's not true. But can I tell you something? Men like Rob Bell and Brian McLaren are liars. 
Plain and simple. I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm not going to stop naming names. Listen, I believe that it's the job of a New Testament pastor to shepherd his church. And I I think it's high time that we stop apologizing to the sheep when the wolves come around the flock. I think it's time for some men of God to get some unction full of the Holy Ghost. And when there's a wolf out there, to make as much noise as possible to the sheep to stay away from the danger. And these men are destroying the church. And then this fourth one is the convergent church message. You've heard of that, haven't you? The convergent church message is supposed to be a combination of conventional church and the emergent church. Sadly, it's being led by the president of one of your Southern Baptist seminaries. It calls on the church to let down her guard and let's use the best of both worlds where we're supposedly doctrines not compromised, but let's, let, let there be change so that we can, we can face the world and be relevant to our society. Now that sounds good on the surface, but can I just tell you that I want to be on record today by saying this. I don't want anything to do with the emergent church. I don't want to be tied up with Brian McLaren or Rob Bell. I don't want to do what they're doing. I don't want to say what they're saying. I don't want to look like they look. Listen, it seemed like to me the Bible said, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers to come out from among them and be you separate, says the Lord. I don't want to be tied with that bunch. Listen to what the Bible said. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. I want to be one who will stand before you and say that the church doesn't have to look like the world and talk like the world and act like the world and behave like the world in order to be effective in this world. It's time for the church of the living God to rise up from the ash heap of complacency and defeat and with all of our convictions and our faith and our boldness to preach the word of the living God. It's time for us to be unashamed of the gospel. Can I get a witness today? Call us old fashioned. Call us behind the times call us foolish, call us whatever in the world you want to but let us make it known that our desire is not to be pleasing to a lost world, our desire is to be pleasing to a holy God and when the trumpet sounds and the Lord Jesus Christ comes, I want to be found faithful in the sight of my Lord and my Savior the sin in the pulpit it begins with a false message but it's born on false leadership Just very quickly, the Bible said that the priests rule by their own power. That word rule there means to tread down, to oppress, to crumble, to literally, it means to walk on a person. The false prophet, the liar, the deceiver, the wolf in sheep's clothing clothing through his lies and his deceit. He treads down and he oppresses those he deceives. And as many men today are walking all over the church, they're ruling by their own power. They're crumbling and they're oppressing the people of God with the deception of a false gospel. I so often want to cry as Paul did, Oh foolish Galatians who has bewitched you. I want to cry to the church of America who's been so blessed with so many great men of God who have, who have faithfully declared the Word and preached the Word of God. This country has been saturated with the truth. And yet here we are, just barely over two, approaching 300 years old, and we've already lost our way. We so often point our fingers at the nation of Israel after they see so many miracles, and we say, what a foolish people that they would reject God so quickly. And yet here we are, completely different from them. Unlike them, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And yet just even quicker, we forsake the Lord. I tell you, I don't know about any of you, but my my heart was stirred as Brother Herb shared that story about how that boy got saved and revival broke out in that church. And the next week, I mean the next week, there they were. Pouring the cold water. What's well, a shame that God just doesn't rain fire and brimstone down on this whole nation. I mean, it's a wonder why He doesn't do it. Huh? When a man can get you to believe his lie, he'll lead you just about anywhere. And the trouble of it is today is we've got so many feel good preachers, and that's all that people want is they want to feel good. And so they send all their money, they give all their time. And the reality of it is, is they're going to die and go to hell. Huh? 
There's the sin in the pulpit, and here's the second thought, and that's the sin of the pew. If you notice verse 31, the Bible says, and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? The word love there means to delight in, to be fond of, to covet, to be passionate about. The people of God, according to what the word of the Lord says here, they delighted in. They, they were fond of, they coveted, and they passionately loved their lying priests and their false prophets. God reveals here that the responsibility for the spiritual condition of Judah and for the nation of Israel lay not only on the shoulders of the prophets and the priests, but it lay at the feet of the people as well. Fast forward to the New Testament. The Apostle Paul wrote to the young pastor Timothy and he admonished him to remain bold in his preaching for the Word of God. For he said, the time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. This is exactly the spiritual condition of the church today. Having turned away from the truth many believers love, they delight in, they're fond of, they care about, they're even passionate about all kinds of doctrinal fables and lies and heresies because they appeal to their selfish, lustful desires. It tickles their ears, appeals to the flesh. When I was a boy, I raised hogs. I learned something about hogs. They'll eat anything. When I was in high school, my egg teacher told me a story about they knew a fellow that went out to feed the hogs. He had a heart attack and he died. By the time the family got to worrying about him, they went out there and they find the hogs had him half eat up. Hogs will eat, eat anything. I, I visited a hog farm one time and I suppose every hog farmer does things differently. This hog farm that I went into, he had long rows and he had the hogs in the cages and he had them stacked three and four high. The only one he fed was the one on top. His excrement would fall down and that hog would eat that. And his excrement would fall down and that hog would eat that. And I thought about that and I looked at that and I said, that's the church of today. That's where we're at. The reality of it is, my dear friend, the sin and the pew is that there are far too many people who can be described as spiritual swine. They'll eat anything that anybody gives them because they either cannot or they do not discern biblical truth. And in many cases, all they're doing is feasting on spiritual excrement that is fed to them by false preachers and lying priests. What are you feeding on? And then he closed. He said, what will you do in the end? What will you do in the end? Well, I tell you what, I'm convinced. I, I'm, Brother Danny said it. I, I'm a young guy. I don't have near the years as some of these other fellows do and the experience. I don't have their wisdom. But I tell you what I believe. I believe we could preach every hour from now to Jesus comes but it's not preaching that's going to change us. We could have services all day long today, tonight, tomorrow. We could extend the meeting. We'd just stay here for two or three weeks. The truth of the matter is, until we get out of these chairs and we get broken before God and begin to weep over sin and stop blaming everybody else and we start confessing the sin as if it's our own, Brother Luther preached from Nehemiah. Let me tell you something about Nehemiah and guys like him and Daniel and Ezekiel. They didn't just pronounce against the darkness, but they got on their faces before God and they repented for the nation as if they were the very ones committing the sins of the people. And far too long we've sat in the comfort of our buildings and we've yelled and we've hollered and we've denounced everything out there in the world. And don't get me wrong, I'm all about preaching against what is wrong. But the things that are wrong will change when we get on our faces before God and repent. Father, I pray you bless the preaching of your word and the hearing of your people. In Jesus I pray. Amen.